Good morning, everybody. Check one. Out. And also everybody in the lobby that is currently getting their coffee and croissants. Well, welcome. Welcome to Echo Community Church and a happy Memorial Day weekend to everybody here. Uh, hopefully you guys have some awesome plans for, from, for Memorial Day weekend. Um, also, if you or someone you know served in the military, uh, thank you so much for your service first and foremost, but also uh, for all of the families who are continuing to celebrate Memorial Day, whether you have somebody in your family or someone who um, died in the line of duty, we want to thank you so much for their service as well. So hopefully you guys will take some time over uh, tomorrow to express your gratitude to the people who um, continue to serve in our military because the reason we're in this building right now is because of some of the, the effort that is put into um, not just those who serve um, in Coast Guard or all of our branches of military, but even overseas as well. And there's a lot of sacrifices that are made, um, so we just want to express gratitude to your families um, and to you if you have served in the military as well. Um, the biggest sacrifice, of course, that was ever made was Jesus Christ, and we're here to celebrate that as well because Jesus uh, ultimately is why we have hope, why we have eternal security, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for Jesus today. So um, in our service today, we're going to do a couple of different things. We're going to continue on our series in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll hear from Pastor Phil. Uh, he'll be giving us a word about that. And we also have a missionary guest with us today. Mr. Ed is going to be sharing with us, and his family is here with us as well. They're awesome. His son Israel is so much taller than the last time I saw him, which is crazy how fast people are growing these days. But it's awesome to see them. Um, they'll be with us and share a little bit about their ministry so that we can continue to partner with them. Um, and then we'll go ahead and practice community as always because we are a community church. We love our community. So with that being said, let's jump into some singing to start this worship service. If you're willing and able, will you stand with me this morning? Keith and the team are about to lead us in a few songs. Uh, but let's, let's embrace Jesus' presence today. Let's open up our hearts to him because uh, he's opened up his heart for us this morning. He wants to hear from us. Um, and so let's, let's sing to him. Let's praise him. Let's worship him this morning. Keith and the team, why don't you take it away? All right. For those of you in this room, you get a special treat. You get to hear the first song. <laughs> let's worship the Lord. <laughs> From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God all powerful untamable awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing Second verse. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and gave source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful. Untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing, God. You are amazing. 
praising God indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing God all powerful untamable all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing God indescribable indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god incomparable unchangeable you see the depths of my heart and you love me the same you are amazing god You are amazing, God. You are amazing, You're amazing, Lord. We worship you this morning. Everything that you've made is wonderful and good. Father, and we are in all of you. We worship you. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah name above all names blessed redeemer for sinners the ransom from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all His body the bread His blood the wine broken and So amazing, love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Amen. sinners the ransom from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all all our hope is in you let's sing it together all our hope is in you all our hope Jesus. 
Jesus Messiah. Sing it, church. Name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel. The rescue for sinners. The ransom from hell. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. It's a perfect song for us to start thinking about who Jesus is and what he did for us, especially as we get ready right now to receive and participate in the Lord's Supper and communion together. So I want to invite our welcome team to come. And in just a moment, they'll pass baskets down the aisles that have uh, juice and wafers on the inside. And um, if, if you're new to us here at Echo, I want you to know you're welcome to participate in communion with us. The only requirement the Bible gives is just that you're part of God's family that you have uh, been saved by Jesus by putting your faith in him and by uh, repenting from your sins. And if that's the reality of your life, I invite you to participate with us this morning. And so, team, you can begin to, to pass those baskets up and down the aisle. Just take one and hold on to it just for a moment, and I will lead us through communion together. In this moment, while we're being served, um, good idea to let Jesus kind of wash over our hearts. I was out working in the yard a little bit yesterday. My wife took the boys to um, the pool we belong to opened up and she took the boys to the pool and my reward was weeding. <laughs> Just has to be done, right? And um, you know, I was digging in, you know, I like to dig down and get the roots out and not TMI, but my fingernails were in rough shape. That was done because when I was done, I recognized I am hungry. You know, I was about ready to go home and tear into. When I'm really hungry, I'm not even thinking rationally about what to eat. It's about what can I get into my face the fastest, right? But I noticed I was like, my fingernails and my hands have been all up in the yard for a while. So you know what I needed to do first? I had to go wash the hands, wash them really well because I did not want to bring all that yuck into that time of of meal time for me. And you know, Paul gives us some really good counsel. He says, this is something, and Jesus said, communion, what we're about to participate in, it's something we're supposed to do as his followers. We're supposed to do it regularly. We're supposed to do it often. And we do it to remember what Jesus did on the cross so that we never forget about it. We don't take it for granted. We take that memory from the past and we bring it up in our mind and we, we bring it into the present tense. We also look at ourselves right now, and it's a moment for us to be thankful and say, thank you, Jesus, for the progress you've made in my life. Thank you that I'm not who I used to be, that I'm on a journey, making progress in my journey towards Christ-likeness. But it's also an opportunity for us to look ahead and say, there's coming a day when we won't have to eat these delicious wafers anymore or drink this juice that's been hanging out in a plastic cup for a while. We'll be face-to-face -face with Jesus, with our brothers and sisters forever. But Paul says, before you come to Jesus' table, it's not so much that we all need to line up the bathroom and wash our hands. He says, take a moment and allow Jesus to wash over your heart. The cool thing, that the, the reality of this for me is, man, when I got my hands all messy outside, I had to do some hard work to make them clean. But when you bring your dirty heart to Jesus, you don't have to do the work. You just confess those sins to Jesus and he does the cleaning. And so we don't want to bring sin to Jesus' table because Jesus died to pay the price for our sins. So we don't want to disrespect him by bringing to his table the evidence of things he died to save. So why don't we just take just a few seconds before that we eat together, just quietly, and just each of us individually just say, Jesus, look over my heart, and if there's any unresolved issues between you and I, Bring it to my attention so that I can confess it. And if we confess our faults to Jesus, he's faithful and he's just and he'll forgive you of those sins so that we can come to his table, not just with clean hands, but with clean hearts. So why don't we do that just for a moment? Why don't we just allow Jesus to wash over our hearts so that we can enjoy this together with nothing getting in the way of our relationship with God?
friend, I pray that you'll just receive the forgiveness and the grace that Jesus is offering. If you confessed it to him, he's forgiven you. You can forgive you too. Just let it be washed under under his blood and receive freedom and grace and mercy. And don't let whatever that is hang over you anymore. Let him just lift that load right off your shoulders and feel that freedom of just being totally forgiven and totally in right relationship with God through Jesus. If you haven't done so already, you can go ahead and peel back that top layer and and pull out this wafer that we use. It's just a symbol. It's just a token of Jesus' body. And let me read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul writes, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. He gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church family, let's eat of his body together this morning. In verse 25, the apostle continues, In the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup represents a new covenant between God and his people. It's an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That's why you should, as we did this morning, examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. Let's drink of the cup together this morning. I simply don't know where I would be without Jesus. I simply don't. I'm so thankful that I know him, that I've met him, that I experience him, that I enjoy him. I know a lot of us know Jesus. Do you enjoy him too? I just enjoy him. I enjoy him when I'm alone in private moments. I enjoy him when it's just me and a family member, one of my sons and my wife, just enjoying being together and Jesus being with us. I enjoy Jesus together with you. All of those experiences are unique. One of the high points of my whole week is when I get to enjoy Jesus with other people. Some of you are like me and some of you are not like me, but we're all brothers and sisters who share the same dad. That's what makes us a family. And so I am just so glad that you're here because my morning would be different if you weren't here. I need to be with you, enjoying Jesus together with you today. And so we're going to sing another song together. It's such a simple but a powerful song. Our welcome team's going to come one more time because I know we don't have a nice place for you to deal with these. And so we'll collect those. We'll make sure they get, they get uh, thrown away so that you don't have to be encumbered with these. But I want to invite you to, if you're familiar, it's an older song. It's an older hymn. Very powerful, very simple. I encourage you to, to sing along, to think about these lyrics, and to make them personal. To make them personal today as Keith and the team lead us. In the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, in the morning, when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, you can have all this world, just give me Jesus. When I am alone, when I am alone. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. 
give me to die when I come to die oh when I come to die give me Jesus give me Jesus give me Jesus You can have all this world. You can have all this world. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. Lord, we pray that you see the sincerity of our hearts as we sing this. It's a prayer that's realistic, but it's also in some cases aspirational. It's something that we want to be true, even though we recognize there's still a battle in our hearts. God, you know that. You know, you know we want you and you alone, and yet our hearts play a tug of war with us sometimes because there's material things in this world that we want and we desire too things that we can have and own and possess, things that we can be. And we know those things in and of themselves aren't evil, but sometimes, Lord, we value those things more than you. And we look at you as something we can add on to all the material things we can possess, and we repent of that. The Holy Spirit, you're going to have to help us because that is a battle we can't win on our own. We want to value you highest, Jesus. So help us in our hearts, because our hearts, they're so fickle. We want stuff and things because of how they make us feel and how they make us look and the way that we think about ourselves when we have them. And at the end of the day, we know the reality is we can't take any of those things with us. But Lord, I sensed something change in the atmosphere of this room just a few moments ago. And Lord, I know you sensed it too. I sense a deep longing from the people who are here to have you. And it's interesting because we have you and we still want you. And both of those things are realistic. We have you and we want you. We want you not because we don't have you. But what we're saying is we want to be more aware of you. To be more confident and sure that you're in us that you're on us, that you're near us, that you're around us, that you're beside us. It's your presence and your companionship and your friendship and the togetherness that we want to be more aware of. Because Jesus, that provides for us a contentedness and a joy and a security and a safety that nothing else provides that's durable. And so Lord, I pray that over my brothers and sisters today that they will know you better that they will experience you more tangibly, that they will recognize your voice more clearly, that they will feel you near them this morning, loving them, caring for them, protecting for them, providing for them, and enjoying them. Lord, we know why we enjoy you. It mystifies us why you enjoy us, but the psalmist wrote that you delight in us. And so, Lord, we do not want to withhold from you us. We give us to you. We give ourselves to you. And you can take this whole world. We can have it. You can take it. But at the end of the day, we want you, Jesus. That's what we want. And so we lay that at your feet today, knowing that you love to answer and respond to that prayer by drawing near to us. And that is in and of itself a treasure that is priceless. And we thank you that you share it with us, not because we deserve it, but because it's your character to give it to us, not based on our resume, but based on Jesus's. We thank you for that. 
Open our ears and our hearts so that we can receive what you want to teach us today through your word, whether it's here in this room or whether it's uh, with Pastor Zach and our students who are going to Club 58 or with Pastor James who's in the Discovering Echo class, whether it's with Kendra or any of our leaders who are teaching in our kids' environments. I pray that all over this campus, this will be a great day of the Holy Spirit making us a little bit more like Jesus. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Amen. Glad you're with us today. Why don't you take a moment, turn around and say good morning to somebody. And if you're in grades five through eight and you'd like to join Pastor Zach and our students in Club 58, you can meet him right out of those back doors and you'll head over to Club 58 and we'll bring you back to the end of service. So glad you chose to be with us this morning on this Memorial Day weekend. You know it's Memorial Day weekend, right? A few of you did. I just reminded you. Some of you have off work tomorrow. Some of you don't. I'm sorry that you don't. But um, I do just want to encourage you. Um, many of you know this. Maybe a few of you aren't aware. Memorial Day weekend was originally established for us to pause and to reflect and to be thankful for and to think about and consider the men and the women who died in military service to our, in serving our country, to protecting our rights and our freedoms that we currently enjoy, one of which is being able to meet here together and worship the Lord and assemble together unapologetically and lift up his name. And for some of you, you may not have a personal connection to anyone who has uh, given their life and service to this country, but um, probably someone in your circle does. And so it would be appropriate among all the other things you have planned this weekend, whether it's cookouts or cook-ins or whether it's working or just spending a leisurely day at home traveling or staying put or going about your normal routine just to pause and reflect and to be thankful for and to thank God for the men and the women who put their lives in harm's way so that we can enjoy uh, and, and we, I'm, <laughs> we are not a perfect country there is no such thing there is a perfect kingdom and I hope that you're a citizen of God's kingdom um, but we are thankful for this country and for the opportunities and the freedoms that we have here. And so I would just encourage you to take some time this week and just a few moments and reflect on that. I know there are those within our congregation who have family members and people close to them who have uh, given their lives serving in the military. And we want you to know we recognize you. We honor you. We're close to you and our, heart, our, our thoughts and our hearts are with you today. And so just include that as part of your activities this weekend. It's just something appropriate and proper for us to be able to do uh, on this holiday weekend. I have the privilege of introducing to you, I, I sometimes say a special guest, and that's true. But at the same time, uh, the Bosch family are not guests. They are part of our church family. Ed and Miriam and their four amazing kids are missionaries that our church supports every month. In fact, they were one of the first missionary families that we decided to support on a monthly basis when we became a sovereign church in 2019. Some of you who were with us back then remember that was a journey of faith for us. We started uh, July 1st, 2019 with zero dollars in the bank, but we were a sovereign church and we had a heart for missions. And we said, by faith, we're going to believe that we can support two missionary families uh, every month. Uh, the good news is that three years and 11 months later, as of last week, we now support, I, I counted wrong this morning, so I want to correct it, 22 missionary families every single month. Um, the reason we're able to do that is because many, many, many of us give of our money above and beyond what we're already giving in a tithe or in a regular offering to our church. We give above and beyond that specifically to missionaries. And so as that, as that giving increases, we support more missionaries. 
And so right now we send somewhere between three and four thousand dollars a month every month to in, in monthly support to missionaries. And then additionally, we do some special projects like um, like a project I'll be talking to you a little bit more in detail next month is about a church construction project we're partnering with in Nicaragua. I haven't really gotten to talk to you about the trip that Pastor Zach and I took and bring to you a full report other than I cobbled together a quick video one of the weeks when I got back and I, I wasn't even in the room. They played it two weeks and just seeing that video and my short appeal at the end, um, you know, I, I made a commitment on behalf of our church to $25,000 which is 10 times more than we've ever committed to any project. We played that one video without me even standing in the pulpit or talking about it again. You've already given 5,000 of that $25,000. And so I know within the heart of this room are people who say, we wanna see God's kingdom expand. And so when Ed and Miriam and their family are with us today, it's an awesome opportunity for us to hear from people, from part of our family that are serving the Lord in South America, in the country of Ecuador, in the city of Cuenca, serving a hole in the gospel there, which is reaching university students. There's four major universities there with hardly any ministry going on. It's been uh, something that's a passion of their heart because they want to see the kingdom of God increase in perpetuity in Ecuador, and they want to see that young generation reach for Jesus, but there's just not much going on there. So they've opened up their hearts and their homes and their lives. They have dreams of when they return to be able to plant a new church downtown where those universities are to be able to just continue reaching those young people to be saved and I pray that many of them get called into the ministry and become pastors and and step into those roles um, in that country and lead them forward but it's a it's a calling that God's placed on their lives they come from a medical background Ed uh, was a was a physical therapist Miriam is a is a registered nurse they have as you see four children uh, picture was taken just a little bit a while ago because their oldest son Israel is now he's 14 but he's six foot one and so he's a little bit taller but um, they are dear friends of ours we love them so much they've been here uh, we, anytime that they come home and they're able to be with us I want them to come but I invited them to come and just share a few moments this morning just what the Lord's put on their heart and tell us a little bit about um, what the future looks like when they return to Ecuador just a few short months from now, and just allow us to encourage them and build them up and support them and, and love on them. So will you join me in welcoming them as they come to share? Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Phil. Thank you, Echo. How are we doing? I heard somebody say, woohoo, that is good. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Ed and my wife Miriam is there. If you see some of our children around, uh, give them a high five uh, every now and then. That's right. Uh, we, we do. I wake up early in the morning and as I'm making breakfast, our son will come down and I'll be like, who is this man entering my home? And uh, it's my son. <laughs> Um, so I want to share with you a little bit, I want to bridge the gap a little bit between what's going on here in the States and in your local church and your local context and, and what the, the God of the Bible is doing all over the world. Because if you look at what the, the, the Bible says about our God is he is not a local God. He's not a shrine or temple God. He in fact is the God of all creation. That includes us, that includes the people that don't look or sound like us, it includes the people we don't even know exist. And that's hard, but the Bible would encourage you and in fact uh, compel you to relate yourself with people you've never met. In fact, people don't even understand your language. And, and I know that's difficult, but I, I want to put this inside of a, a, a biblical context and look at the Bible as kind of a global picture, a universal picture. And I want to, to share with you briefly a, 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 a quick little passage of scripture that I believe the Lord gave us. I, I was asking God, like, what do you want us to share with the churches that, that support your ministry overseas? Like, what, what, what do you want us to know? What do you want us to see? And I believe that he gave us this passage. And you, we can find it in Revelation, and, and everybody said, uh-oh, uh, because Revelation is synonymous with scary, and it doesn't have to be. It, it's accessible. You can read it like the Gospels. You just got to know what you're looking for. Uh, but let's look at Revelation chapter 21. We're going to fast forward all the way to the end of the story, and, and many of you may be familiar 
with how this ends, but, but it, I believe it is, it is underemphasized in, in the church. And I'm going to get to why that's important in just one second. So Revelation 21, verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, if you're King James, it says, Behold. It says, Look, God's dwelling is now among the people. A precise Greek translation, a more precise Greek translation would say, look, God's abode or God's permanent residence. He has moved in permanently to the neighborhood of human beings. And I want us to sit on that and just marinate in that for just a second because we have such a theology of, of, of we just got to get people saved, man. It's just souls, and we got to get these souls to heaven, and then we forget that heaven actually comes back to earth. Earth is actually quite important in the eyes of God. We conflate, when the biblical authors talk about the world, we conflate that with this planet, and, and we start to say things like, this planet is bad, and we got to get out of this earth, and, and what they're talking about is the world systems of governance and power and authority are quite wicked, and we need to turn to the kingdom of God, but this world, this earth, this creation, in fact, God would look at it and say, actually, I like it. Revelation continues to say, John says, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, whenever you hear a biblical author repeat himself twice, it, it, it's a, a kind of a Hebraism of saying, like, hey, pay attention. They're not just repeating to, like, be repetitive or redundant. It says he will, he, he, they, he will be with them twice, and, and they will be his people, and he will be their God. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Why? Because at the end of human history, God will validate, acknowledge, and, and give a nod to, hey, being human has been really hard for a really long time. And I know that. Because in the person of Jesus, I live it. We don't have a God that's far off. We have a God that wants to dwell with his people for eternity. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And behold, the new has come. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I want to share that with you, not to sound theological or deep or, or to derail and, and, and take over this, uh, this service. That's not, I, I, I think it's important to contextualize missions, in fact, in, inside the fact that all of human history is screaming like a freight train towards a point of finality. And our jobs and our kids and our necessities and our daily needs and wants and desires, they can hijack our thinking and, and begin to, we, we, we forget that like, oh, hey, we're, we're coming to a point of finality. And we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing with this gospel? What are we doing with the talents, whether they're one, three, five, ten, or however? What are we doing with the revelation we've been given? And so that's the question for my wife and our kids and I, and that's why we do Medical missions, as my wife is a registered nurse, I'm a former physical therapist. That's why we work with other uh, ministries, church ministries. We, we spent two years uh, with about two, um, two and a half, and that's complicated, but whatever, uh, <laughs> different churches and, and building their youth ministry, building training youth leaders to build more comprehensive, not larger numbers, but larger uh, skill set and capacity to reach young adults. We've worked with local churches. We work with, with outreach and VBS, and we do all these things. And, and we always got to ask ourselves, why? It's because we're not that spiritual. If you eat with us, you'll figure it out pretty quick. We're pretty, like, yeah. <laughs> why? Because all of human history is screaming towards a point of finality. And I cannot fathom the idea of somebody inside my sphere of influence looking at me and saying, I didn't know, why didn't you tell me? I can't fathom the idea of, of, of and I don't want to focus on human effort, but I can't fathom the idea of us doing basic, simple human things apart 
from this context. That's why we open our home to students. That's why we have teenagers and 20-somethings and, and college kids come over to our house and put their nasty feet on our furniture and eat up all our food and go through our fridge like they own the place, right? Because anyways, uh, and we love it because in the process, they get to know Jesus. In the process, they get to find purpose and meaning and beyond that, eternal life. It's like, like this quick story of this, we, we have this little home group. We ran out of our home, and, and, and it's tale as old as time, right? She was chasing Jesus. He was chasing her. It, it, was, it was hilarious because he thought he was slick, and I was like, boy, I could smell you anyways. <laughs> and in the process, they're just living life and talking, and we're, Miriam's cooking, and we're talking Bible, and, and things are happening, and... and and at a certain point, a couple months in, he, he called me. He called me and was like, hey, I need to talk to you. And I was like, yeah, like, what's up? And he's like, um, these past couple months, I've been going to your group, and I don't have the slightest clue what you're talking about. And I was like, oh, well, you know, okay, so you want to talk about that? He's like, no. He's like, I'm concerned that Jesus is real, and I don't know what that means, and it's keeping me up at night. And I was like, oh. So what do you want to do? He's like, I, I need you to just, I need you to give me everything you got. He's like, I'll meet you where, whenever, whatever. Like, and so we started having coffee and we started texting. We started talking and chatting. And discipleship looks different and weird nowadays. So we do discipleship via like WhatsApp and like anyways. Started like investing in this guy. And he's like, hey, I really like Emmy. I was like, I know. <laughs> he's like, oh, you knew? I was like, boy, you're not, you're not that slick. Anyways. <laughs> And I, we, ha we had the privilege of doing their premarital counseling, and we had the privilege of walking them towards that decision of marriage and what that means inside the kingdom and for, the, for, for God and what it, what it should look like. And, and we had the privilege of marrying them, and they, they now have a beautiful, she is absurdly beautiful, this precious little baby girl, Sophia. And they've been living together and married and have a baby and just as a, as a functioning family unit on Jesus. And you think, wow, how mundane, like not, not multitudes and bajillions of people getting slain in the spit. No, no, a family that Jesus put together. And they're going to raise their daughter in Christ. And who knows what that's going to look like in 20, 30, 50, 100 years. And so I want to encourage you. I'm going to turn it over. I'm gonna, I want to encourage you. Number one, thank you. Thank you for investing in missions us, definitely, but just all over the world because this is just like a tiny like tip of the iceberg of what Jesus is doing all over the world. And you get to be part of that. You get to invest in that. Uh, and I hate using that invest word, but like really, like you're, you're investing your talent and then people are putting it to work, right? And then at the end, like we get to come to that point of finality and say, this is what we did, Lord. It wasn't perfect. In fact, it was really ugly most days. <laughs> It was messy, but we, we produced some fruit. Here it is, right? Here's Juan Andres. Here's Emmy. Here's Sophie. Like, here's, here's our, the fruit of our work. And, and so thank you, right? And then just continue to pray for us. Continue to pray for missions all over the world because it's really, God is just so much bigger than, than what he, 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 he's doing just in our local context. So thank you. Uh, we love you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Phil. Thank you. Please stop by and see them uh, after church today. They'll be out in the, in the lobby, and you can just stop by and uh, just let them know that you support them, that you're for them, that you're praying for them. Those things mean the world to our missionaries. Um, just before I continue our teaching on Sermon on the Mount, I generally try not to check any, check any text messages during the service because it can be all kinds of distracting. But sometimes things are going on, and I need to watch them. But... Um, you will notice that Adam and Havila Swiger are not with us this morning, and that's okay, because if you have not heard, um, I have her permission. She sent me a couple pictures right now. They are now enjoying their twins, and so um, that is Alba on the left and Nehemiah on the right, and they are happy, and they are home, and if you know, um, it has been, they've been on pins and needles because they were getting ready to come out 
way, 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 way too early, but they have obedient children. <laughs> and there they are. Uh, and she was saying, do you have the other one? I said, yeah, this is them this morning. Uh, yeah, apparently I put them to sleep. So, you know, there, there you have it. But uh, I'm just thankful um, for the faithfulness of God over their family. And uh, so thank you for all of your prayers. Sometimes you want to just see the fruit of your prayers. And we were praying for this family and praying for these kids. And there they are. And so hopefully we'll get to meet them very soon. But I wanted to share that with you, those of you that may not have heard or you might not be on social media. Just want to let you know that the babies were born healthy and they are now home. Didn't have to spend all those days in the NICU that they were prepared for. They are now home and uh, enjoying their very new life. They just got married a little bit over a year or just a little less than a year, right? Just like almost a year to the day. Um, and so, boy, they're not wasting any time starting their family. Just doubled the family already, went from two to four. Um, she, Havila told me, she said, well, I had prayed ever since I was a girl, I'd prayed for triplets and God only gave me twins. I'm like, well, sweetie, that's wisdom on God's part, you know, just like, <laughs> let's see how twins work out and then we'll go from there. But, um, that's just been the desire of her heart to be a mom. And so we're just thankful for that for them. So, um, Sermon on the Mount, let's transition into that. We have just a few moments this morning. We've been studying through Sermon on, Jesus's Sermon on the Mount, a few verses at a time. And so this is the longest recorded sermon of Jesus's that we have in the Gospels. I want to start with a tough question. Where did Jesus deliver this sermon? Yeah, on the Mount. Are you okay? I'm trying to, it's Memorial Day weekend. I'm going to start with the easy ones. And sometimes in Baltimore, I need to ask the easy ones to know. Because the way you look at me when you're deep in thought and the way you look at me when you're completely daydreaming is exactly the same. And I don't always know. So sometimes I have to ask these questions just to see. I need a longer earlobe to make this stay. But that's a problem for another day and another doctor. All right. So I also need to remember not to say everything I think out loud into the microphone where it lives in perpetuity on YouTube. But this is the longest sermon that we have of Jesus's. And it's... It's pretty straightforward. Jesus is talking to a specific group of people. Do you remember the first group of people who heard the very opening part of the message? Who were they? His disciples. By the end of the sermon, there's more people gathered around, right? These are would-be followers of Jesus. They are people who are interested in Jesus. They're not as fully devoted as his disciples are yet, but they want to hear from Jesus his pitch, his explanation for what one of his followers is, what a disciple does, what differentiates one of his disciples from everybody else. If he's a king, then what is his kingdom like? Where are the entrances? Where are the boundaries? And what's the culture like inside of his kingdom? How do citizens of his kingdom act and behave? What do they do? How do they treat each other? How do they interact with the king? This whole sermon is about who Christians are and what Christians do. It's simple, but it's not easy. And he has just finished up a section that Pastor James taught last week about three spiritual activities that all of his followers participate in. And he introduces them with the same phrase. When you give, when you pray, when you fast. He doesn't say, if you give. If you pray, if you fast, he says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. What he's saying is right out of the gate, everybody in my kingdom is a giver. There's no exceptions. Everybody in my kingdom prays. Everybody in my kingdom fasts. But then he also goes on and says, and there's people outside of my kingdom that give. And there's people outside of my kingdom that fast. And people outside of my kingdom that pray. Let me tell you how my people in my kingdom give, fast, and pray differently than people outside of my kingdom participate in those spiritual activities. You have to go back to last week to get that. But then Jesus does something that's really refreshing, and we don't want to miss it. Jesus not only says there's some spiritual things that his followers need to manage well, he says there's some material things that his followers need to manage well. 
Jesus is aware of and concerned about stuff and things. Possessions. Things that you buy using money that you have. He's aware of that. He's, because, let's face it, we are living in a material world. And, no, I'm not going to finish the song. I'm not going to quote Madonna this morning. I'm not a material girl. But we are living in a material world. Right? There's things that you need, you have to buy, and if you don't have them, you're not going to live long. Right? Hello? What in the world? We give you coffee. I'm trying to figure out where I need to start with this this morning. All right? You're not going to live long if you don't have shelter, food, water, medical care, right? Okay. These are material things. If you don't have basic transportation, if you don't have a way to earn money, if you don't have some, some, some clothes to wear, some shoes for your feet, some basic things, maybe some basic ways of communicating, there are basic necessities of life that are material things. You can have them, own them, buy them, possess them. You need them. And the Bible is not anti you having things. I want to make that very clear because there's a way that that gets taught. And there's a way that what Jesus says here gets twisted just a little bit that could leave you with the impression that Jesus doesn't want you to have a savings account. That Jesus doesn't want you to think about retiring one day. That Jesus doesn't want you to have any more than one pair of shoes and one shirt. There's a way of twisting this. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't saying that any of the stuff and things of life that you can possess or have are evil, nor are they righteous. They are morally neutral. They're neither good nor bad in and of themselves. They're just things. Okay, They're just things. What I can drive, what I can earn, what I can rent, what I can own, where I can vacation, what I can collect, how I caffeinate myself, all these different things. They're stuff and things. They're material things. And Jesus talks about it. He tells us that in his kingdom, people still need material things. It's just they treat material things differently than the way people treat material things outside of his kingdom. And he does something really convenient for us. He groups all of the material things of life into two buckets, necessities and treasures. Now, I don't want to get into an argument this morning about which is which. Okay, because some of you, I might say, that's not a necessity. And you say, oh, yes, it is. If I don't have that kind of shoe to go with that kind of pant, you know, I don't want to split hairs. That, well, anyway, I don't want to get down to the nitty gritty of all that. But Jesus is going to talk to us about both. He's going to talk to us about the things in our life that are extras that we have to store. Because we don't use them in the normal, they're, they're beyond our necessities, they're extra, they require storage. Closets and sheds and drawers and glove boxes and that center console that Lord knows no one should go into, right? Your bottomless purse, you know, like they're extra and necessities. He talks about both. And he's going to make some pretty solid but very challenging statements about how people in his kingdom, how Christians, how disciples should manage material things. Let me read to you the short section we'll study, and then we'll unwind it pretty quickly together this morning. And if you'd like, this deserves a whole lot more time than what I'm able to give it this morning, but if you scan the QR code, you can download the full study guide, all my resources. There's, you'll see some new books in there this week. That's because I have been blessed to be able to receive some volumes from uh, the late Dr. Baldwin's library, and um, and so some of those are in here, especially the book by G. Campbell Morgan is a knockout. I have a first edition copy of it from his library, and it is incredible, the work that he does on this passage. It's unbelievable. So thank you to Dr. Baldwin's family and to Wayne and Glenn and, and Joan for allowing me to have that, and now part of his legacy is living on and helping us be able to understand the Bible better. Let me read to you Matthew six nineteen through 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, and if we paused right here, you'd see, aha, I've heard this before and I already know where you're going. Jesus is against storing up. 
Jesus is against storing up anything for ourselves. And he's definitely against treasures. And you hear that. We call that the poverty gospel. Have you ever heard the poverty gospel before? Poverty gospel says this. God wants us to have nothing. The less you have, the holier you are. And so what we need to do is is to live, every Christian should live on as little as possible and give all of the rest of it away to the church and to missionaries and to the poor. Just give it all away and live on nothing. And the less you have, the holier you are. And the more you have, the more sinful you are. And they take a verse like this and they say, see, I just trust Jesus. I don't save up for retirement. I don't save up for a rainy day. I have no emergency fund. I own nothing. I give it all away. Therefore, I am holy. And yet, if you skip down to 20, he says, store up for yourselves treasures. So he's not anti-storing. He's not anti-storing up. He's not anti-storing up for yourself. And he's not anti-treasure. But then you can take it and say, oh, see, this is the prosperity gospel. God wants us all to be wealthy, says the Bible. It usually just says the preacher, right? And the holier, the more that I have, the holier that I am. God wants me to be blessed and highly favored because you can't be highly favored without blessed. And that looks like jets and cars and real estate and clothes. When you think of wealth, do you think of a full closet or an empty closet? I think of a full closet and multiple. Do you think of one car or a fleet of cars? One plane or a plane? Do you think of a house or an island? Like we, when we think of material wealth, we think of abundance and excess, more than what we basically need. And it's interesting, the Bible doesn't say it's prosperity gospel, that the more you have, the holier you are. It doesn't say it's the poverty gospel, that the less you have, the holier you are. The Bible teaches stewardship, and that is to be content and faithful with whatever you have, whether it's a lot, a little, or in the middle, because it's not yours anyway. It teaches stewardship. Because in the Bible, you have people in poverty, people in wealth, and people somewhere in the middle who are all used by God. And yet, in every one of those classes, you can find contentment. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin don't destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21, for this is interesting. We usually reverse the word treasure and heart in this. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we usually, when you hear people repeat this, you know what the Bible says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. That's not what it says. It says, look, look where someone's treasures are. Look at what they value highest, and you'll find their heart close to it. Okay. Then he seems to make a subject change, but it really isn't. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, that's an okay translation. The better translation is good. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are unhealthy, better translation, evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24, our last verse for the day. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Here's a big idea. It's a couple sentences. But here's, if I could summarize what I think Jesus is saying about material things here. And he's talking about treasures. Do you know how that word is literally translated in Greek? If you go back and read the original sentence, and G. Campbell Morgan does that work for you. What Jesus actually says is, don't treasure treasures. He uses it as a noun and a verb. He's making a play on words. And that word treasure means an an abundance of excess. You think like some ancient treasure chest with gold coins spilling out of it. He's just saying anything you have that is excess. In other words, if you have so many clothes that some of your clothes are no longer in the rotation. They're in the back of your closet where moths are eating them. He's saying, how wise it, is it for you to buy that much stuff that the stuff that you buy, you can't even enjoy anymore. It's just disintegrating. It's like, that's foolish. And we're like, that is wrong. Why do I do it? 
It's almost like he's saying, listen, why do you have that much stuff that you need multiple sheds? And bigger closets. And you need to rent space on someone else's property to store your things. And while they're in there, they're gradually disintegrating and devaluing over time. He can't be talking about that pastor because that's too personal for me. (laughs) Here's what I think Jesus is saying to us. Our need for material things, and we have a need. You were created with a need to possess and have. It's in there. It must never become greed for material things. I'll differentiate in a moment. When need mutates into greed, material things no longer serve us. We serve them. And that results in divided loyalties. And God can't be considered anything less than supreme. Now, odds are you're not going to remember everything I say. Odds are even better that next week you'll probably remember very little of what I say. So I've got to be very realistic about the mental outlook I have to have on a Sunday morning saying, I'm going to get up there and take these 20, 30 hours of study, and I'm going to teach for 30 to 45 minutes, and I'm going to hope that people are going to remember everything when I realize they might remember one sentence. Those of you that teach regularly, you understand that world. But I don't know which sentence you're going to remember, so I've got to make them all important. Here's the one thing that I hope that you remember. You're not chasing treasures. You're not. However, it's very likely that many of us, if not most of us, live with this idea that I can't be happy or content or feel some kind of way until I have a little more salary. Until I get out of my apartment, get into a little bit bigger apartment, a little nicer house. Or I can't finally enjoy what I have until we redo the kitchen or the basement, or replace the sink. I can't really enjoy life until that number shows up on the scale, whether it's higher or lower than what it is right now. I can't really be satisfied until I have that color of Nikes, no judging. Okay. I can't really be satisfied until I have just a little bit more. Just a little bit more salary, just a little bit nicer car, just a little bit newer this, just a little bit more that, just a little bit less weight, a little bit more muscle. And the sermon usually goes, stop chasing those things. Well, that's why that sermon isn't effective, because you can stop chasing that thing, and then you'll just latch on to a different thing. Jesus is not anti-treasure. He's warning you about what treasures do to your heart. Because here's what you're, you're not chasing that thing, here's what you're chasing. Now listen to me. You're not chasing a certain number in your retirement account so you can retire. You're not chasing a number. You're chasing the feeling you think you'll get when you have that number. You're not chasing a certain size clothes you want to fit into. You're chasing how you think you're going to feel about yourself finally now that you fit into that size clothes. And guess what? If that's what you're chasing, you better hope you never get out of that size because then you'll feel miserable. It's not that you're saying, man, if I could just, if I could just own that car, oh, that, that BMW or Land Rover, whatever it is, that Mercedes, if I can just own that, then I'll have made it. And the sermon usually goes, forget about the Mercedes, forget about the BMW, be happy with it. And I don't want to name any car because you might drive it. Okay, I'll name what I, uh, you, you'd be happy with a Honda. That's what I drive. Okay. The issue is not the BMW or the Mercedes. The issue is what you think that car will do for you. You've given that car permission to tell you when you can be content. You've given that amount of salary permission to tell you when you can be all right with yourself. You've given that number and your retirement account permission to tell you when you can finally feel a sense of security. You've given that wardrobe permission to tell you how fulfilled you can feel in life. And if you've done that, you've made them your savior and them your master, and they don't serve you, you serve them. And that's the warning Jesus gives. 
And he says, I'm going to describe to you two different kinds of investments you can make. Two different kinds of treasure you can have. You can have either one. You can have some of both. He says, all right, here's investment A. You can see it. You can touch it. You can enjoy it now. But it has an expiration date. From the moment you have it, it's going to start diminishing and fading. Also, it's not theft proof. You'll need to protect it because it could be stolen. Also, it will devalue over time. It will eventually be worth nothing. It will deteriorate materially. It might even disintegrate to the point where you can't see it anymore. It might rust. It might get eaten up. Oh, and the other thing, it's not durable. You can't take it with you forever. That's category A. Here's category B. It's thief-proof. It won't burn up. It does not deteriorate. It does not devalue. You can't see it tangibly right now, but it's 100% safe and you, it will last forever. It is durable. Now, most people in their right mind, if they're not trying to outsmart the speaker, if I said, which of those two things is the wiser investment, which would you say? You'd say B. And we're like, okay, Pastor, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to, you know, yeah, you're making an analogy of what Jesus is saying. Well, yeah, the point that I'm making is we're not arguing that what he's saying is wise. My question is, why is it so hard? It's kind of a no-brainer. Well, yeah, that's where, that's where I should be investing. I should be investing my life resources, not in accumulating for myself abundance and excess because of how I think it's going to make me feel. I should already feel content in Jesus so that I don't need those things to make me feel some kind of way. I already feel that kind of way because Jesus makes me content. He is all that I need, and those things are add-ons. Unfortunately, the human heart says, I need to get all of the things that I have to feel content, and then you can add Jesus to that. And at the end of this chapter, Jesus says, his kingdom is not the add-on. We seek him first, and all these other things are the add-ons. And in his kingdom, we have to have a radical reversal of values. So what do we do? Well, I hear what the pastor said, and yeah, I really do. You know, my car's dying, and I really need a new car, so I guess God's saying to me through the sermon today that I shouldn't have that. I should just, that's not what it's saying. No. All you're doing then is trying to change an external thing in your life and hope that that changes your heart. That's not what he's saying. Jesus cares about the material things in our lives. But when needs become greeds, we elevate those material things to the position of masters and lords in our life. And then we need them to feel some kind of way. And Jesus is saying, the reality is, even once you have them, yes. And some people say, well, pastor, I, I did buy a new car and I did feel good. Great. Seven years later, when you got into that car, did you still feel as good as the first day? Well, well, yeah, it's, it is a little messy and a little nasty. It does smell like last week's Arby's. It is kind of a, you know. It, no, you probably cursed that same car on year 10 that you thank God for on year one. Lord, deliver me from this death trap. I need something new. Why? I know, I know the Lord's testing my faith because of this car. You thanked him for it 10 years ago. The problem is it no longer delivers for you. What it did, it started to fade in its content delivering abilities the day you got it. Or at least until you pulled up next to somebody who had something newer and nicer and more expensive than what you were driving. There's probably a day when your apartment was the most amazing blessing God ever gave you. And then you turn on HGTV. And you're like, oh, I didn't realize that I needed to have all these upgrades and crown molding and backsplashes and slack bashes and all these other types of things that I don't know. I need to have two identical twins come and tear this whole thing down and build it all back up again. And then once I finally got that paid off, the styles will change and there'll be new people on HGTV and I'll have to do this all over again. Are you designing your kitchen for them or for you? Is that car for you or for somebody else? There's a young man that I was doing some just basic financial counseling with about nine years ago. He's years ago moved out of state, doesn't moved out of state, and 
doing something different now, but he was getting into real estate at the time, and he didn't come to me for real estate counseling. Heaven help him if he did. I don't know real estate. Um, I know these 66 books. I don't have a lot of other skills beyond that. But it was about developing a budget. He wanted to follow some of the principles we teach at Financial Peace University, and he was just starting in real estate. Hadn't sold any properties yet, but had gotten some listings up. And his car that he was driving was no longer reliable, and he had some money saved up, and he was talking to me about whether he should take the money that he saved up, which was enough to buy a very decent pre-owned vehicle, pay cash for it with no payment, or go borrow money and buy something different. And I advised him, hey, what do you need right now? You need a car that's reliable and safe that can get you to and from. You have enough money saved up right now that you can pay cash for it. You don't have a payment. It's a better, you know, go that direction. He said, okay, that does, that sounds wise. Well, the next week that I saw him, he was driving a brand new Lexus. And I was like, okay, well, tell me the story. He's like, yeah, well, you know, I appreciate what you said, but I talked to one of the more successful realtors in my company. And he told me not to go buy something new, something used. He said, when you drive up to meet the people that are going to look at your property, you don't want to drive in in a car that's three or four years old. They're not going to think that you're successful. You need to drive in on something new and shiny so that the moment they see you, you inspire their confidence and you say, look at me, look how successful I am, and that will make them trust you more. And I'm thinking, you're not successful. I didn't say this because that would have been horrible, but I'm thinking, but... You haven't sold any houses. You've sold nothing. So think about what you just did. You went and put yourself in bondage to a lender to buy a car you can't really afford yet to impress people who don't know you better, to think you're different than you really are so they can backfill your image by giving you money so that later on you can actually be as successful as you're borrowing money from people to appear to be. That's messed up. And that's almost all of our lives to some degree. We spend money that we do or we don't have to buy things that we don't need to impress people we may not even like. We do things and we buy things and we treasure things because we think it's going to make us feel some way we don't now. I'll finally be able to have my house look as nice as the neighbors. I'll finally show my dad that I made it. I'll finally drive a car that's as nice or nicer than all of my coworkers. Is it for you or for them? Why do you, better question, why do you feel like you have to look as good as everybody else? It's because you're discontent. And you think material things will solve your discontent problem. I've got news for you. It might solve it temporarily, but it'll wear off, and then you'll feel worse. Almost out of time. Let me give you three quick points. But why is this such a problem for us? Why do we? And listen, this impacts all of us. We all wrestle with this. We came into the world with our hearts wanting to have just a little bit more. Number one reason we chase after stuff more than we should, discontentment. We are simply not content. One of the greatest treasures in the New Testament was Paul writes to us, I have learned to be content. That says something to us. You did not come into the world content. You had to learn it. Havala will be able to tell you her babies did not come into the world learning. I should just not tell anybody. I should just be okay until someone remembers to feed me or change me. You came into the world discontent. And you will scream until someone makes you content. No one sits an infant down and teaches them to do this. We just come into the world this way. When my son was this many years old, I was trying to find the picture on my phone. I couldn't find it. I took a picture of this. I'm trying to describe it as best I can. We're sitting in the basement of our house on North Wind Road. I remember my son sitting on the floor and being very, very upset with me. And I'm sitting and I'm looking at the room and he's right here in front of me, right in front of a train table I just assembled, in front of shelves from Ikea filled with toys saying, I don't have anything to play with. And I was like, just sit still. Let me take a picture. 
And all around him is a room filled with toys. You know what? I'm not content. It's the next toy that will make me content. What I'm saying is no one taught him that. That's how his heart works. John D. Rockefeller, most wealthy man in the world at the turn of the 19th century. He was, yeah, yeah, somebody said it. <laughs> yeah, he, his net worth at that time in today's dollars exceeded that of Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. Okay. He was asked, how much is finally enough money for you? He said, just a little bit more. That's discontent. Jesus says, if you are in the habit of storing up excess to the point where it's corroding or you have to put it in safes or banks, you can't even use it all. It's just excess. What he's trying to help you understand, first of all, you need to understand why you're doing it. You're doing it because you think you'll finally at some point have enough to be content. In other words, you and I connect contentedness to material things. And what Jesus is saying, as long as you do that, those material things will be more of a Lord over you to you than I can be. And there is no such thing as a second place Lord. So how do I break free? You experience the fullness of contentment that only Jesus can provide. And you know what the result is? Freedom. Complete freedom from the expectation of what material things have to deliver to you. Wouldn't it be nice to live in such a way that whether you have a lot or a little or you're somewhere in the middle, none of those things determine how you think about yourself. They don't determine your contentedness. They don't determine your security, your safety, your confidence, or your self-image. What if you could just live independent of the influence those things have over your content bucket? That's true freedom. And what Jesus says is, I am the only one who can supply those things in you forever. And if you receive that from me, then it's not a problem with the things anymore. You can have them, but they won't have you. You can possess them, but they won't possess you. You tell them where to go. They don't tell you where to go. How many of the things that you do, if we traced it backwards, you're doing it because you're serving the pursuit of a thing you don't have that you want? Why do we do it? Because we're not content and the solution is to discover the contentment that only Jesus can provide number two devaluation this is a hard one Jesus says look where someone's treasures are what they treasure where they put dollars and time into in abundance where do they put the most of their money, the second most, the third most, the fourth most? Jesus draws a, a direct connection between what you treasure and where your heart is located. Now, this might make you uncomfortable because it makes me uncomfortable. I'm not your accountant. I don't care to be. I don't know what or how you spend your money on unless you tell me. And why would you do that anyway? But it's going to be, you're setting yourself up for a sobering encounter with Jesus. If the reality of your life is that you give more to Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks and Target than you do to missionaries. To help the poor. To expand God's kingdom. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people over the years... Pastor, I just, you know, I know I should give to the church. I know I should give to missionaries. I know I should help the poor. I, know I, help the poor. I just, it's just hard for me. Here's, here's the reality. There are certain things in your life that money flows freely out of your pocket. It can't get out of there fast enough. You don't think about it at all. For me, it's my kids. I have a problem. Oh, that's so admirable. I'm just being honest with you. It's my kids. We have to set a budget at Christmas because I'll overspend. Some of you, you have to spend a budget because you won't spend. They have enough already. They should be thankful for the air they breathe, right? I have a problem. I do. It flows out of my wallet fast and reckless. If you have a bad day and you're like, oh, I just want to, you know what, if I, that, that Frappuccino will cheer me up. You'll find six bucks. 
the next morning, oh, I'm having such a good day. You know what I should do to celebrate? Frappuccino. Running late for breakfast, better have a frappuccino. Oh, I'm going to skip lunch. Oh, I, I missed lunch today. Well, I guess we'll call that fasting. And I'm just on the way home, I'll get a frappuccino. You can't fast retroactively, by the way. Pastor, are you anti-frappuccino? Should we all? No, that's poverty gospel talk. What I'm saying is this. If money flies, flies faster towards those things and more easily than it does for the things of God's kingdom, you should at least step back and say, why is that a problem in my heart? Are you a follower of Jesus? I absolutely am. Then why is it easier for you to give your hard-earned money to a coffee or a tool or this or that than it is to God's kingdom? I'm just asking you to do the exercise of asking why that's still a struggle. The answer is because the reality, as much as you don't want to say it, you value those things a little bit more than God's kingdom things. You will have a hard time convincing Jesus that you valued his kingdom more if there's no evidence to back it up other than your well wishes and your intentions. Oh, I woulda, coulda, shoulda. Well, what did you do with what I gave you? Well, I didn't have a lot. Well, you buried a lot of it in Starbucks. Well, I couldn't give to my church because, you know, they don't sing enough hymns. and They don't do communion often enough. Okay, have you investigated how Howard Schultz of Starbucks spends all your money? Well, that's different. How is it? If you're going to start going down that road, then be consistent in everything. You know where BGE, all their employees spend it? You want to go down that road. Those are just excuses to cover up the fact of devaluation. If whatever you treasure, your heart will be there and so will your checkbook. Now that you all love me so much, how about number three? Disbelief. Pastor, at the end of the day, if I live the way I think Jesus is living, I'm not going to have any stuff. I'm going to be naked. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to have poverty. I'm not going to have high-speed Wi-Fi. I'm going to have to delete some apps. I'm not going to be able to vacation. I'm going to have to beg for things. I have to downgrade from downgrade from Chick Fil A to Burger King. No more frappuccinos, just chinos. Make them out of pods at home. I just don't think the kind of God that I think He's just He's oh, He's always wanting from me things that don't belong to Him. You sound like one of the dudes in Jesus' parable. Well, I didn't, I buried my one talent because I know who you are. You take what doesn't belong to you and all you're looking to do is get a handout from everybody. So I just buried it in the ground. Jesus gives an idiom that we miss because I'm not Jewish. Can we go back to verse, um, the, the eyes verses, I think 23 and 22 and 23. Yeah, verse 22. The sounds are not fit. I'll land, I'll land on this because I probably ticked half of you off and the other half wasn't paying attention. So let me just land here. Listen, at the end of the day, you have to hear it. I had to hear it all week. And I did not escape unscathed. My wife and I sat down yesterday, Excel spreadsheet in hand, and like, listen, can we just talk through this again? We want to make sure we're okay with the way that we are balancing out our needs, saving for the future, giving and living in a recipe that is blessable before the Lord. And there's more than one way to look at that. But at the same time, I'm just like, I want to just... Not only look at what we're doing, but I want to ask the question, why are we doing it? Is it wise? And are we doing it for the right reasons? Because, look, Bible is not anti-saving for the future. Proverbs says, save for your future. Be like the ants, right? Bible is not anti you saving up money for a rainy day. Bible is not anti you having things. The Bible is very careful about you serving things. Having things, serving things, two different things. Bible doesn't want you looking to material things to do for you what only Jesus can. Because if that's the case, when it comes down to picking one or the other, you'll always pick the material thing. You'll always pick the tool over the missionary if you can only do one or the other. You'll always make the vacation the first over and God will be the leftovers. And it's not the issue of the thing, it's what you look to the thing to make you feel or do. And that's a spot that only Jesus wants. Okay. But here's what he says about eyes. The eyes are the lamp of the body. If your eyes are, I'll put the original word in there. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Have you ever heard the phrase giving someone the evil eye? Okay, don't give it. Some of you have been giving it to me since about 12-12, so stop it. He said it. I'm just helping you make sure you understand it. 
reality is, I don't think any of you are mad at me. You're kind of like where I am. I'm like, it's true. And it's, sometimes that's really challenging to hear. Because it makes me look at stuff in my heart that I don't want to be true, but maybe I'm wrestling with it more than I am. Here's the good news. If it bothers you at all when you're hearing it, that's the Holy Spirit. And how would he be acting on your heart if he didn't live in you? And how would he live in you if you weren't saved? It's just the evidence of you being saved. It's Christ-likeness going on in your heart. It's the process and the journey. And haven't we said before that sometimes this journey is difficult? Haven't you ever heard me say that? This is what difficult feels like sometimes. So welcome to the difficult. All you do is you're going to do one thing or the other. You're going to say, okay, Holy Spirit. You're going to say, not now, Holy Spirit. You're going to surrender or resist. That's your choice, not mine. Okay? So here's what he says. If you, what it meant in the Jewish world to have an evil eye. Thank you for G. Campbell Morgan in this old book from 1929 where he did all the work on the Greek here. In the Jewish world, to look with someone with an evil eye meant to look through a lens of greed and covetousness at someone else's lifestyle. It meant you see someone with more camels than you and you look at them a certain way and that's an evil eye. And you look at them and you don't feel good about their possessions. You feel bad about it. You're mad that they have it and you don't. You see it and you want it, but you can't have it. And you... And you start to harbor greed and covetousness in your heart. And what Jesus is saying is he doesn't want you to have an evil eye because you're, you're going to see God, people, stuff, and things through that lens. Like, well, how come they are driving a new car and I'm out here driving my Honda? I have been at church every week and I pray three times a day whether God wants to hear it or not. I fast a lot. I do this. I deserve how come they get, I bet they knew somebody, I bet they, st and you see through that lens. And Jesus says, be careful. If you live with an evil eye, you're going to have a bad idea of who God is. You're going to see him as someone who wants to take from you, not as someone who wants to give, from you, give, give to you. You're going to see him as somebody who should serve you, not you serve him. You're going to see everything in his life as belonging to you and you're entitled to it. And Jesus just makes this simple point. If your eye is filled with light, then you can see what other people have or don't have. You can see what you have or you don't have. But those things don't mess with your heart. There's no greed. There's no covetousness. It's interesting. These few verses, Jesus talks about extras. The next couple verses, he talks about necessities. And advice on, the, on both is the same. With extras, don't covet. With necessities, don't worry. That is the evidence of someone who's a citizen of his kingdom. So what's our conclusion? Fortunately, they have it for the screen, and I can read it to you. Investing in God's kingdom is a better use of our resources than chasing and accumulating earthly treasures. Because unlike material things, God's kingdom promises returns and rewards that are eternal. So, Pastor, are you saying I should stop saving money and I should stop planning for retirement? I should give it? That's not what I'm saying. That's a whole bunch of external activities. The better idea is what is going on in your heart today? What's going on in your heart today? Why don't you wait till you can understand that and then act out of it? If you just rush to do a whole bunch of external stuff right now, you're doing the same thing the Pharisees were doing. If I just change all my behaviors, maybe my heart will change. This is a heart thing. It's a heart thing. God doesn't have a problem with your car, your house, your apartment, your vacations. Unless you serve those things, then there's a problem. Because what does he say? No man can serve two masters. It's intrinsically impossible. And Jesus is not going to play second place. Lordship means he's first. But the benefit that comes with him being first is complete soul contentment. To be completely accepted. And guess what? When you're free from having to chase those material things to be content, it will become easier for you to chase that feeling of, now I can give the way my heart really wants to give because I don't feel as much hesitation because when I give, I don't think, oh, I'm giving this $100 to this missionary. That's just X amount of less coffees to drink this week. Those things disconnect from you. You just give because you, your heart wants to and your checking account allows you to. 
every time you give to this church, you're investing in God's kingdom. Every time you, you help the poor or you help someone who's going through a difficult time financially in the name of Jesus, you're expanding God's kingdom. Every time you give to missionaries like we do, every time you help be, build churches like we do, every time you help with, with our, you know, uh, the ministry for that, we, that we have for, uh, with the Gabriel Network, every time that we invest in movies in the park, every time that we sponsor classrooms with book bags and backpacks, every time that we give uh, uh, Samaritan's Purse, every time you invest in that, you're investing in God's kingdom. And the mystery of this passage is, well, Jesus talks about rewards. What are they? Gold, bullion, silver, lots of clothes, shoes, better Nikes than what we get here, limited release Jordans only available to Christians in heaven. What are they? Do you trust him? I, I'll just let you know. Here's my theory on it. You ready? I don't think there's vocabulary to explain it. That's my theory. Because if it was just a better version of something you could have here, well, you could still get it with enough resources. But I trust him if that if salvation is as delicious as it has been for me, if he's promising me rewards. At the end of the day, if you come to God, you have to believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. That your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you openly. And that if Jesus says lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven by investing his kingdom with your resources now. Okay. Maybe I don't need so many vests. Maybe I don't need one for every day of leap year. But whether I have them or I don't. Those things no longer compete with the loyalty for God's kingdom in my life. I have a ways to go. I did not realize how materialistic I truly was. Because here's the reality. You don't have to have money to be greedy. You just need to think you need to have money to be somebody to become greedy. I know a lot of people, myself included, who have come from nothing and don't have a whole lot of stuff. And you can get in that place even among my pastor friends. And I'm like, oh, okay. I remember one time a pastor said to me, he's like, did you get up and shovel this? It was during a snowstorm. You got up and shoveled it? I was like, yeah, all day long. He's like, yeah, the people in my gated community were bothering me with their snowblowers being so loud while I was inside with my hot chocolate. I was like, you turkey. But you know what? Even in that moment, something went on in my heart. I was a little less thankful for the house that I had and the snowblower that I owned. I had of a snowblower. A machine that is delightful, that will throw snow in my neighbor's yard. <laughs> First world problems, right? But even in those moments, you know what it makes you think? Oh, maybe someday, I, maybe my house isn't enough. Maybe I need to get a machine and do it too. Why? Why can't I just be content now? Good news, I can. And so can you, through Jesus. Amen? Let me pray for you. Worship team, will you come? Heavenly Father, this is a tough one. It's a tough one. Most of us aren't going to push back about the truth because it's pretty obvious. Where we struggle is where there's just that tug of war in our heart at times. And we certainly haven't wrestled to the ground how all the little loose ends of this passage play out in our lives. It does make us question at times how much is enough. How much is too much? How much should I give? How much should I keep? And Lord, we, we know there are some general truths in this passage, but I also know that you want us to trust you individually and personally to give us each personal wisdom for the details in our own lives. Some of those answers might generally be the same around our room, but specifically at different seasons of our lives. Lord, we need to hear you what you're talking about to us individually or us as a family and what that looks to us right now. Most importantly, Lord, I recognize that this message sounds completely ridiculous to anybody who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. It sounds illogical. It sounds reckless. But probably at the same time also sounds oddly appealing. Like, man, could I really live in a way that I can feel okay with me regardless of my weight or my size or how much I have or how little I have or how big or small of a house I have or whether I have a gated community where someone does work for me or not, whether I can retire or not. 
that I can be safe, that I can feel secure, that I can feel whole, that I can feel without deficit in you and Jesus, my experience has been yes and amen. That is what I have experienced when I met you. And so, friend, if you're listening to this on a podcast or you're watching on YouTube or you're here, I, I don't want you to hear the voice of, of Phil Nauer this morning. I want you to hear the voice of Jesus today. He's saying, please, uh, the, the gate to my kingdom, it's narrow, but it's open. I am the way. I am the truth. If you will but put your faith in Jesus, he will save you. He will transform you. He will send his spirit to take up residence and live inside of you. And he will begin day by day, moment by moment, to transform you into the image of Christ himself. But it begins with a moment of salvation where we believe and we repent. We believe we need to be saved, that Jesus can save us, and that he will save us if we ask. You do not need to know the all of the words of the Old Testament to be saved. You don't need to answer a 20-question short answer test. You just have to believe that you need saving, that Jesus is the only one who can do it, and that he's willing to do it for you if you ask. And you bring to him your willingness to repent. That means to turn away from a life where you're the Lord and you live your way, and instead, you turn and say, I surrender as a servant to Jesus, and I will live his way. Do you believe? Will you repent? If the answer is yes, all you need to do is just say that to Jesus. Confess it to him. In your words, he will hear you. He will forgive you. He will save you. If you need some specific guidance, a simple prayer you can pray, pray is, Jesus, I know I need to be saved because I've sinned. I believe you can save me because you lived a perfect life with no sin. You substituted yourself for me on the cross. The punishment that I deserve doesn't get swept under the rug. You took it. And what you offer me is a clean resume that is yours in exchange. I believe you rose from the dead and you're alive today. And that means that you defeated death and that you're eternal. And I'm taking you up on your promise that if I follow in your ways, I can expect the same thing. So I confess that to you, Jesus. I believe it. I'm deeply convinced. And I turn away from living by my way and what I think is right. And I surrender to your way. I don't want to be whatever I want. I want to be just like you. I receive your Holy Spirit into me today. Lead me. Guide me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, you're safe. Don't have to do another thing. But I do want to encourage you to do something a little brave, just a personal favor from Phil to you. You don't have to do this to be saved. But if you prayed that prayer with me, when I count to three, would you be brave enough to just slip up your hand and make eye contact with me and you can put it right down? I won't ask any more than that. just want to celebrate this moment with you because that's the best decision you'll ever make. Who prayed with me this morning? One, two, three. Anybody at all today pray that prayer with me? Awesome. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. Who else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for new life. Lord, all of us put ourselves before you today and say, continue to work on us. Lord, you don't want any of us to walk out of here feeling beaten down or guilty or downtrodden. You just want our hearts to be open to this conversation about the role we looked for material things to supply us in our life. And Lord, we want to be the owners, not the slaves when it comes to how we relate to. We don't want to be the slave to material things being our master. We want to be able to own and have and possess things without those things owning and having and possessing us. And so Lord, help us to be aware of our motivations for why we chase some things and be able to settle those things through our relationship with you so that we can be free to enjoy those things whether you bring them into our life or not, to be able to hold them lightly. In your precious name we pray. Amen. If you're willing and able, why don't you stand with us this morning? Our prayer team is coming. Our welcome team is coming to receive our tithes and offerings. Our worship team is here. Here's what we're going to spend these last you know, three, four minutes together doing. Our prayer team is coming. And if you'd like prayer about anything at all, you don't even have to wait for us to sing. Just come now to them. Just tell them what they can pray with you about. We'll be happy to pray with you about anything and just keep encouraging you until you get your breakthrough. We're going to give you an opportunity to give and worship the Lord through the giving of your tithes, your offerings, your your uh, your funds for missions and, and all the other things that, that, that your heart desires to give. Keith is going to lead us in, 
in a closing song, and then I'll come back and give you one final thought before that you leave. Let's go before the Lord one more time and thank him for his goodness. That's one thing that you can do is practice gratitude. It's difficult to covet things when you're thankful for what you have. And so maybe we just thank God for that for a moment. Lord, thank you for the things that we do have. Thank you for shelter and clothes and options and choices. Thank you that when we go to our refrigerator and our cupboards, most of us have options. That's more than a lot of the world does. Thank you for that. Thank you for what you have given us. We give you credit for that. Only you can satisfy our hearts. And so today as we give, we're not doing so begrudgingly. We do so joyfully and thankfully because we value you. We value your kingdom. And we recognize that that one of the means of exchange to expand your kingdom is our funds. And so, Lord, we release them to you today and help those of us who make decisions about that to continue to treat that with sobriety and generosity so that we can see your kingdom advance in every possible direction. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. The only name that matters to me The only one whose favor I see only name that matters to me yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling on me only name that matters to me yours is the name the name that saved me mercy and grace the power that forgave me your love is all I've ever needed. When I wake up in the land of glory with the saints, I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. Again, when I wake up. When I Jesus, just that name. 
on your way out, just want to remind you again about one of our big outreaches that we're able to do because you give, and that is Vacation Bible School, or VBS, that's coming up in July. We have a big sign out here on Campbell Boulevard, so letting all the community know. Um, it is from July 17th to the 21st. That's a Monday through a Friday, 9 a.m. to noon o'clock. Um, we are accepting registrations for kids, and we've got the shirts in to begin to distribute those. So please tell all of your friends, especially those with kids, that this is going on. I still have just a few slots for um, some leadership, some volunteer leaders that week. Anything from um, I need another one or two small group leaders for elementary school kids, some activity station director assistants. So if you like snacks or crafts or games or music, we can plug you in there. Otherwise, we're pretty well staffed for the week. But if you'd like to volunteer, shoot an email to that address. It goes to me, and I will follow up with you and get you plugged in. But we can accept registration. So please put it on your calendar and pray about it. It's a huge week for us. We had 65 students last year, 45 of, or 42 of which were from outside of Echo Community Church. Church. It's an awesome outreach for us that we're able to do because of your generosity. And so it's another way we're making God famous here in this community. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you, God willing, back at the next time that we gather together. Make sure you stop by and see the Boshes on your way out, and enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. God bless you guys.